So I'll just get started. Uh, like Colin said, they started the architecture group, and some of my friends who were starting that group reached out and said, hey, would you like to do a talk? And I said no, and then I thought, well, I always say that, so maybe I'll do it this time. And here I am. Um, <clears throat> so this, this talk is about, like Colin said, taking the, the solid principles. It is not about object-oriented design. That's what solid is about. That's what there are many, many great lectures from really smart people on, online. Dr. Bob Martin is the uh, founder of this that, that ideology. Um, this is about cloud architectures. And as I was going through the slides last night, I thought this really isn't even an architecture talk. This is a DevOps talk. But the good news is one way to have solid architecture is to have a solid understanding of how all the pieces are coming together. That's in large part, at least in my opinion, what DevOps is about. <clears throat> so, uh, you're wondering about the pony. When I Googled solid clouds to see if anybody else was talking about this, this was the only hit in Google. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's what it's really about. Um, just a quick disclaimer, my opinions are mine, not my employer's. My employer has lots of great opinions. I work at Petulum, we're hiring. On most of the slides, you will see a QR code. If I'm getting boring, get out your phone, shoot the QR code. There's something interesting there, Easter eggs. Um, this one is the link to get a job at Petrum. And you can ask Magresh. It's a great place to work. <clears throat> so um, I'm going to go through a couple background slides just to cover the basics. This, this slide is from a talk by Sam Newman about microservice architecture. Again, a, a great read if you click through to that. These slides will be posted later. I'll link it in the architecture group on the Slack channel. Um, <clears throat> so the general idea, I mean, there are a lot of different principles that Sam talks about going into the design of a good microservice architecture. But one of the things that I noticed in here that uh, very, is very similar to what I'm going to be talking about is the idea of isolation, the idea of independence, um, the idea of keeping things simple. Um, another thing, another thing to keep in mind when, when I, at least when I'm talking about cloud architectures, is Kubernetes because that's the box that I live in most days. Um, Kubernetes is a fabric for deploying microservices, really for deploying things in containers uh, on on a cloud, sir, on a cloud architecture, cloud on a cloud. <clears throat> Uh, so Heroku put together these 12 factors um, as best practices for for building for building applications on their platform. Um, and you know, since the talk is really about building solid cloud applications, why am I not? Why isn't it a 12-factor talk? Because there's a lot of 12-factor talks. Um, because I'm lazy and remembering five things is a lot easier than remembering 12. And most of all, because talking about solid clouds gives me an excuse to use the pony GIF. And the last background slide is, is what we're here to talk about, um, except not object-oriented design. Um, just a quickly buzz through them, and then we're going to go through a lot more detail in the next 30 or 40 slides. So the first one, single responsibility principle, is I think of it as the rule of one. Um, it's about keeping it simple, keeping it isolated. Uh, the open-close principle is, uh, the tagline for that is change is bad. Uh, Liskov substitution is really just uh, a reasonable expectation of types. <clears throat> Interface segregation principle is the rule of small. Uh, and dependency inversion is about decoupling. There's some concepts to keep in mind as we're going through this. A single responsibility is, <clears throat> like I said, it's the rule of, of one. Um, the idea being that it should only change when, when the requirements change. Uh, and if you have, if your thing only has one reason for being, one concept, uh, if it's isolated, then the reason the reasons for which you may have to change it, the reasons for which it will break, the reasons for which will bugs will be introduced, becomes a lot smaller. Um, <clears throat> and with a smaller bucket, you have fewer bugs. 
which is this, you have a single point of truth. When you package your thing together, it's in a single package, whether it's a tarball or a Helm package or a dev file. But there is a way to package it that gets all the miscellaneous parts where they belong, the way that they belong. Um, you don't want to check out a Git repo and try and build it on your production servers. That will work a bunch of times, and then it won't in a really bad way. <clears throat> so um, taking take a look at the single responsibility principle as it applies to DevOps, um, some, just some ideas uh, to take away. You know, when we talk about it in object-oriented design, we're, say, we're thinking about one class. You know, that function has one purpose. Uh, you know, there's, there's a single path of execution. <clears throat> But when we expand these concepts out and we start talking about how they apply to our cloud design or to our DevOps uh, principles, um, some of the things you can think about is I'm going to have one, one Git repo for a thing, whether it's a, a DLL or a JAR file or uh, you know, a, you know, it's, it's the content side of your website. Or <clears throat> but you've got these things isolated in a single code base that builds into a single releasable thing, one package. Uh, <clears throat> and each one of those things has an explicit version or tag per release so that you always know which one of that thing is it. Uh, one action per build job. So as you're, you know, you've got your build script and it's very easy to understand where did this fail? You can see which balloon turned red, which, which line has the big fatal on it. And it's much easier to trace in and figure out where you made your mistake and turn it around. And that's a big part of keeping, you know, that, that idea of single responsibility is if there's only a single responsibility, if there's only a single behavior for the thing, then there's only one, ideally, one way that it's going to break. And it becomes much simpler to diagnose, fix, and move on so you don't get locked up. Um, <clears throat> and just keep going, one source for trusted artifacts, uh, a single configuration template, um, but maybe that configuration template breaks out into multiple value sets, one for dev, one for production, one for my desktop, one for yours. Um, <clears throat> another way that you can look at single re responsibility applying to beyond just the code base uh, is thinking about testability. <clears throat> so each thing should be testable. Um, each of those tests should have a single path of execution through it, a single assertion to the test. Um, <clears throat> and just the simple quality of, is it testable? Can, is there something that I can identify about this thing I built that I can describe in terms of a test? <clears throat> so moving on to the, the O of solid, uh, open for extension, closed for modification. There's, uh, you know, when, I, when I stumbled across this notion of it, it this is the the definition right there. It's a Lego brick. Um, they are infinitely composable, but you're not going to take it apart. This is only going to have eight bumps on the top. It's only going to have eight bumps on the eight sockets on the bottom with those three little holes if you're feeling kind of crazy. But <clears throat> it doesn't change. But you can do a myriad things with it. Um, the big the the takeaway from the tagline for open for extent, OCP principle, open for extension, closed for modification, is that you want to resist change. So this, this Lego brick is not going to change. And by the way, that's not a Lego brick. It's somebody's CAD drawing that was in free images online because all the Lego stuff is copyrighted. Um, <clears throat> but it's, it's not going to change. You're not going to mutate it. You're not going to modify its behavior. But how you use it, it's a brick, it's a car, it's a leg, it's a foot. <clears throat> it's a hat. It's all about context. So when we, when we take that open-closed principle out to the cloud, one of the ways that really is, seems pretty clear to me when I think about it is how my code behaves depending on the configuration set that I give it. So <clears throat> when I build my code into containers, uh, yeah, 12 factor talks about storing the config in the environment is one of the 12 factors. Um, and so when I talk, think about that in Kubernetes, I am isolating my secrets. So my secrets are deployed as a thing in my Kubernetes environment in a particular namespace or 
you know, generally across all the namespaces, and they are separate from the from the code itself, which means so that's a way that OCP begins to affect the overall security of my platform. I don't know if any of you have ever looked in a Git repo or in other source control and seen passwords or certificates. It's, uh, it's not where you want to be. <clears throat> um, so, like in the environment, not in the source code. Not in the source code. Not well. So, twelve factor means specifically. They say specifically in the environment, but I would and I generalize it a lot more to just say. It's in its own place. It's separate from. So there are secrets, and you have a way to get secrets in, and it's only about you know, getting back to single responsibility. There's all of these principles. No one of them is terribly useful. If you try to religiously follow a particular one, it might make your code better, but it might also, you end up kind of lost. They all go together. They all feed, to get, feed into one another to build a more solid uh, application architecture. So with so in Kubernetes, you know, I'll, I'll take those secrets out of the code, um, but I'll also inherit a lot of environment from my namespace, from the cloud where I'm deploying. If I'm in AWS, there are certain variables that are going to be injected into my runtime. Um, <clears throat> there are, and then within my Kubernetes deployment, there are additional environment variables that will be set, and all of those will filter in. And if I build my containers so that they're reading in a lot of that information, just from the environment, then there, there's, those nested contexts begin to change the behavior of what I'm deploying. Uh, how, many, how many replicas do I get? Uh, what, what subdomain are they looking up other services on? Um, <clears throat> permissions, uh, storage, backends, etc. Uh, so then an additional, so then you can so, but one of the things I get with Kubernetes is, so I've packaged my code in one thing, and I've got configuration, and I've got my container, and now I need a way to pull all that together. Um, Helm is a tool that I use to pull all those things together. Um, it gives me a way to, I can still very explicitly declare, this is the value set for this particular installation. Um, I can also have another value set that's built into the Helm package and then yet another value set that's built into the spec for, for that pod, for that Kubernetes app. Um, <clears throat> and it just, each of those abstractions, each of those layers is defining just that single, that single behavior, but then as they all fold together, they begin to affect the behavior of the overall system. <clears throat> so, uh, a little rant that I've been banging my head against lately is, uh, is anybody familiar with Docker latest? You do a git pull latest, and then you run it, and then you come back a week later, you push some changes, you got a new container out there, it's working great, git pull latest, git pull comes back immediately, you run it, it's still as broken as it was the day before. Yeah, that's because it's a tag. And this, like I said, so a lot of what I'm trying to talk about is the right way to do it, but this is a case where Docker kind of blew it. Um, They've got another thing called labels. Labels, on the other hand, are immutable. When I create a new container, when I do Docker build, I can specify a label for the Git hash, I can specify a label for the architecture, I can specify a label for my birthday, just in case you guys want to keep track of it. I can specify a label for anything. <clears throat> and those are fixed in the container image. Unfortunately, the only way I can see them is by running Docker inspect and parsing that JSON out and extracting those values. So they've got the feature that you need to be able to get the thing that you need, except it's hidden behind tags, which everybody changes tags, and the Docker pull mechanism doesn't really quite work. In Kubernetes, they addressed it somewhat with pull policies. So I can have a pull policy on my pod, which is my collection of one or more Docker containers, that says always pull, sometimes pull, pull weekly, but that's a case of a leaky abstraction. So we've got you know, the responsibility for which one of the, which, which instance of this thing is this container is really on the container. It's on the Docker framework. The fact that Kubernetes had to build something into the pod spec to kind of force that, override that broken behavior. It's just a demonstration of how it, how it got broken, and now that that's 
a normal thing in Kubernetes, it makes it even more confusing when I try to run my containers in a CI test because it works great on the, in the uh, Kubernetes cluster, but now it doesn't work great when I run it in a Docker Compose or a Swarm. <clears throat> uh, Barbara Liskov, she's the one that gave us Liskov substitution. Um, all of the other letters uh, in this are actual descriptive names. Acronyms are hard. Naming stuff is hard. Um, finding something that started with L that fit in this that made sense was apparently also hard. Uh, but Barbara Liskov uh, wrote a very complicated explanation of is a versus has a relationships. And Liskov substitution is talking about the is a relationship, meaning that if there is a thing and it exhibits an interface, that all things that exhibit that interface will behave the same way. <clears throat> so in a cloud or Microsoft architecture, you know, it, it points to I've got containers that are Node.js servers. So I can reasonably expect that they're all going to have a service port that's going to serve up some form of HTTP interface. Um, but it also extends to how a team or an organization or an industry segment will converge on certain expectations, like you know, logging to standard out. So we assume that all of our things now in the cloud are logging to standard out so that all we need to do is scrape standard out. Most of our frameworks do that and pipe it off to a place where we can begin to aggregate our logs and have some clue about what went wrong when things go wrong. Um, <clears throat> pull metrics versus uh, trying to push them out. <coughs> <clears throat> Abstracting security and permissions away from the actual implementations of the things. <clears throat> so another uh, one way to look at how Liskov substitution applies in some of the 12 factors um, these are the two 12 factor definitions uh, port binding that like I said with the Node.js server that I can always expect that there's going to be a port and that even though outside the container it's bound to port 8080 inside the container or vice versa inside the container it's bound to 8080 outside the container it's bound to anything that means it makes it very easy for me to scale out 30 of those and all of those ports whether they're on one host or many hosts will map to a reasonable port within the container. Um, <clears throat> they have prod parity, meaning that as a developer, I have a reasonable expect, when I push things into my development environment, I have a reasonable expectation that it behaved well there, it's gonna behave well in production. Obviously, I'm not gonna be running to the scale or the load that I do in production, but I should have similar deployment mechanisms. I should have, you know, if I'm deploying to Kubernetes in production, I shouldn't be running it in Mesos on my desktop. Um, but really, uh, that was all kind of boring. The, I, I recently ran across a tweet, which is this code, about uh, garage doors and HTTP. Has anybody stumbled, come across that story? So this guy, actually I'm gonna click on it. So this guy, <laughs> so HTTP get, right? You, you get this page, you keep getting this page. I've gotten this page several times today. And it always comes up the same thing, same way, and nothing else happens. Yeah, so this guy, um, it's a relay, it's hooked up to the push button on the garage door, it's a door at home. So, so he, uh, so he hooked up this thing so that he could open and close the garage door from his laptop, except it's a get request. So every time he hit that URL, his garage door opens, his garage door closes. So that's an example of Liskov not done right. And that's what happens. You get a garage door that's misbehaving. <clears throat> um, <yeah. clears throat> so the I in a solid, um, obviously nervous as I'm racing through these. So if you guys have questions, comments, um, catch me making something up, feel free to give a shout. The, uh, <clears throat> so the I in interface segregation is, uh, it's, like I said, it's the rule of the small. Um, the idea being that 
each one of these things can stand alone. Um, but even more so, to abstract it out a little bit away from just that object oriented, that code mentality, we start thinking about it in terms of what is the minimum useful bit of functionality that can be defined in that particular context? And this is where the interface comes in. Where does that context overlap with something else? So <clears throat> my interface isn't what my thing does. My interface is where it touches something else. It's how am I implementing HTTP handlers? How, how do my routes map in my app? How, <clears throat> Um, how am I accessing backend storage? How am, how am I getting my code to the different environments? Those are all the interfaces. They're the places where the things intersect. And when you start thinking about how are those isolated, and again, so interface segregation uh, couples very, very well, at least in my mind, with that single responsibility principle in that I don't want my interfaces to overlap. If there is a way to do something from here, to get from here to there, I want there to be one path. Um, <clears throat> I want it to be a clear path. Now you can stick in, then you apply something on this off, and that one path, there are many ways to actually get there, but they're all taking the same path through that same interface. They're all having that, they all exhibit that same behavior. Again, making it easier to understand your system, easier to compose your system. And even more, you know, I, I skipped past it on the uh, the open close slide. But one of the big things that I've seen that makes a lot of products, architecture, solutions wildly successful is when people figure out how to do things that you didn't anticipate, and that's composability. If you give them the ability to make something that you never imagined with what you built, they're going to do that eventually, and that's often an ingredient in wild success, referencing back to that Lego brick. Um, <clears throat> so thinking about interface segregation in terms of 12 factor, uh, a couple of the things they talk about uh, administrative processes that you know, every one of your administrative tasks is an isolated one-off thing. It's separate from your application code. It's outside of, <clears throat> it's outside of your deployment logic. Um, similarly, uh, your processes, Th they're also isolated, um, execute the app as one or more stateless processes. That also is an important thing to think about when you're building your Docker containers. Um, uh, a popular Docker anti-pattern is the container as a virtual machine, where you've got, you've got uh, startup scripts that are triggered from init D, and they're starting some background processes and you've got some other things going on. You want one, pro one PID per container, one process. A container is literally a wrapper around a Linux process. Um, so this guy, why is he here? Um, <clears throat> in Kubernetes, a lot of teams will deploy uh, what I've read called a bastion node, which is it's outside the cluster. And this is a way that you can separate some of those administrative processes. So one of the things that I've seen those bastion nodes used for is an SSH as, is as an SSH proxy. So I've got my Kubernetes cluster out there in AWS, and I don't want to make any public routes available to that control plane, because if you get that vulnerability and you start mining Bitcoin on there, my AWS fees are going to go through the roof. Um, <clears throat> so one of the things to do is don't open anything. You can't SSH to my master. You can't SSH to my nodes. There's a box out there that if you know the credentials for the next hop that you can SSH proxy through, but then you've got to get two, dif you've got to get two different vulnerabilities. So <clears throat> that's, a, that's a, a purposeful isolation for security. Another way that those bastion nodes are used is setting up uh, some kind of a gateway server, and that's doing your authentication. That's pushing, that's users come in, they hit that really quickly. That box is tuned very well to, to do the the credential auth or whatever auth you're using, and to authenticate the users, and then it passes them on, and your application gets into, okay, I know that this person is who they say they are, now you can start to do the authorization to see what they're allowed to do, and you use thing, the tools that are built into your platform in the Kubernetes to authorize that role. 
Another huge um, way that interface segregation uh, has personally saved me a great deal of time, and I think it's a really important thing to think about when you're designing your applications, is observability. <clears throat> uh, so if each of the, my request comes in, it hits one container, you know, that parses it out, determines what the intended action is, then it gets routed to another container that decorates something or triggers a side job, dumps it into a queue, another thing starts a worker. You know, it bounces through all of these things in a matter of a couple seconds. I've got a couple thousand of those hitting my, my, my cluster every minute. It becomes very difficult to understand where did it go wrong if when I'm logging, I'm not expressing an identity, an identity for each one of those interfaces that's being hit. I'm not... Uh, correlation ID, you know, the correlation ID. So there's an, there's an ID for the, for the request, there's an ID for each of the nodes, there's an ID for the version, there's an ID for the host where it's running. All of that information gets logged, and then suddenly your logs become a really valuable tool and a really powerful tool for diagnosing what happened. And it gets into, so on one hand, it's, it's about separating those interfaces, those isolating them. On another hand, it's about making sure that each thing has a distinct responsibility so that I know when I see container foo got hit, I know that somebody was trying to get some food. Um, moving on. <clears throat> so the D, mid all the way through. Uh, dependency and version principle. And I just copied the, I was getting tired when I put this one together when I got to the last slide. Um, so I just copied the definition. Uh, high level modules should not depend on low level modules. Both should depend on abstractions. Abstractions need not depend on details. Details should depend on abstractions. And that's one, of, I, I hope that I've touched on this a little bit as we've gotten this far, to get this far. But it's about, you know, so it's about separating those things, but it's what happens when we separate those things. So. <clears throat> When I take that configuration data out of my container, so uh, let's say I've got an init container, and that, or I've got a container, and it knows how to get things from Amazon S3 and copy them over to storage. When I configure that, uh, when I test that out on my desktop, I run that Docker, I mount a volume to a local directory, I set some credentials in the environment, it goes out, gets stuff, I say, ooh, that worked. I push it up to CI, <clears throat> it does the same thing, except it pipes that off to another filter that makes sure that the file content is correctly, it runs it through a hash, it checks the SHA sum, okay, great, I actually got the file that I expected to get, moves on. I deploy that in my cluster. Now it gets, it gets configured with um, a map to a persistent volume from Kubernetes that's either mapped to that node host or maybe it's mapped to uh, some kind of a shared file system that all of these these nodes are using, and I configure it to be an init container, so it comes up and dies before the actual application starts. So now this thing comes up, but I deployed seven of them. They come up, and I also told them to communicate, to broadcast over a local channel what they were getting to make sure that if somebody else is getting that, they don't duplicate it. Now all five of my clusters come up, they all go out, they grab different channels on all that data, they pull it down really fast, they start up, it always comes up. If only three of them start up immediately and two of them are lagging because they couldn't get resources, that's okay. Those two will come up and they'll say, oh, the files are there. I don't do anything. Exit, everybody comes up, the data is still there. <clears throat> so you change the behavior by getting those details out of the implementation. The implementation still stays really simple. Copy stuff. But then as you apply those layers, those configuration details, and you abstract them out into, through the different, you know, I talked about you know, how the Helm modules provide, give me some control over it, and the Kubernetes spec gives me some control over it, <clears throat> and my cloud provider gives me some control over it. All of those things. I'll just check my notes and see if I actually talked about what I said. And one last rant. I hate your database. I hate it with a passion. SQL databases do not belong in the cloud. They are the antithesis of stateless. Their whole reason for purpose is to store state. <clears throat> Except sometimes you need them, and sometimes they're really easy. 
So you build abstractions around them to make them work. Um, use a stateful set to make sure that, that when that thing goes down, it always comes back up on the same host. So that way your database still has quick access to a local drive. Um, it's not trying to read and write from over NFS and struggling. Um, yeah, so the tension pool. <clears throat> right, so one of the other challenges you have with databases is it's not as simple as bumping your replication number from two to three because all of your clients are not necessarily going to map to the right thing. But you can build abstractions around that to make it work. So then suddenly you've got six copies of Postgres running in your cloud. They're all serving up the same indices. They're staying reasonably in sync. Um, but you didn't have to do a monolithic uh, replication backend behind it simply by building those abstractions around it. Now, in my opinion, the better answer is don't use a SQL database. Use something else. Abstra abstract out your storage. So the frequency with which you actually need to have all of your data in a single table is not very high. Occasionally you'll need that. Maybe you're doing some, some kind of uh, analytics. But even then, most frameworks that you're going to be using don't want it as a cursor. They want it as a as a CSV, as a text file, as a bunch of objects in a queue. So you're going to end up abstracting it anyway to get it into the analytics framework that you're going to be using. Um. <clears throat> right, so some of the mitigations that you'll, you'll end up applying if you do want to use that, that relational database in your, in your cloud application. Uh, so another way to think about it, um, getting back to the DevOps cycle, is when I build my thing, I'm going to have dependencies. And I want to explicitly declare that I, depend, that I know this works for that version and that version and that version of my dependencies. You know, getting back to the latest tag. I don't want to say that I'm using whatever the newest thing is. You know, in your uh, in your gem file, you you generally want to say that you're you're going to bound it at you know version one, but not greater than one, um, or or you might say one zero nine if you know that this is the only one that works and I'm not trusting anything else. So. Dependency version across configuration management and quality, if the API is able to express and abstract the relationship with its dependency specifically, then deploying that thing with confidence becomes more reasonable because you know exactly what you're going to be deploying with. And then you're going to want the abstractions around that. Um, that's what Docker gives you. That's what, uh, <clears throat> that's what your cloud is going to give you by segmenting your cloud and and having those dependencies where you, where you expect them to be in the underlying layers, in the base containers, as you build the new versions and build on top of those building blocks, you inherit the behavior that you expect. So that's the end. Um, I copied a lot of images from around the internet. This is where I got them from. Um, <clears throat> that's the end. So be the pony. So uh, any questions, comments, suggestions? I would love to hear them. Um, so if you're not storing your state in a RDMS, I guess, where do you prefer to store it? NoSQL is uh, used some variation of NoSQL depending on what the application is and what the usage is. Sometimes I don't store the state. Sometimes the state is, you know, it comes in. It goes through transitions, it comes back out. You know, there there might be static content, um, there might be dynamic content that's delivered, and maybe behind that content is an RDMS. Maybe there's just a, a traditional web app that's serving up that content. But when I think about applications where I've got a lot of microservices that are working together, 
I want that storage. I want that that unit to be well abstracted away from the rest of my cloud. <clears throat> so wrapping the database in a service, is that, I guess, that's more in the, other, in the order of... Kind that, that's a mitigation that you... But it's, it's, it's pushing it up to kind of a, a blockier level of interaction. Chunky, you know, like the chunking size is bigger. Yeah. Rather than, you know, do this right, do this, do this right, do this right, you're like, I'm going to work with this, I need that data set. So right, so it's... Yeah. Here's, my, here's, the, here's my updates, ship them back. And the more abstractions you can put around that, the better off you are. And then one of the things that you'll find after you start building out those abstractions is, oh, wow, I don't need the database. I can just drop these messages in a durable queue because I don't need them to be around forever. Or maybe I do need them to be around forever, in which case I'm going to have something pulling, off, pulling on that durable queue and serializing them off to a NoSQL storage or something. Is the advantage of NoSQL just the, it's able to replicate it's designed. Cluster a lot better. Yeah, it's designed for cloud. It's designed for cloud applications. You know, databases were grew up in an era of um, big client server computing, where it was reasonable for me to order another forty thousand dollar computer. You know, when I needed to expand. Would it be accurate to also say that it generally fits the microservice model better? It's not that you've never used a, uh, uh, an RP of that. Uh, it's just that generally for a microservice RP. Right, and that's what that's what I was saying is as you build the abstractions around your RDMS to make it work well in the cloud in a cloud solution, in a microservice solution, you're gonna find, oh wow, instead of an RDMS behind this, I could just use something that's a, a lot simpler and cheaper to deploy. What about like the hosted options? I like, you know, Amazon's got like what is it, RDS or something. Basically they manage it for you and they handle all of that. They've built it they've built an API around it and they deal with all the headaches for you. Mm -hmm. Something like that. It's, that works, yeah. Um, and I've I've seen it work well, and I've seen it hurt, you know. And and that's true for any of these things. I mean, there's no there's no perfect answers. There's no right and wrong. These are just concepts to think about. And, and that's really what I wanted to get across with this is as you're designing, as you're building, ask these questions. And a lot of times you can ask the question and you're gonna say, you know what? I need to get this out the door this week. It's going out this way. I'm breaking the rules and sending it because. We need to get it done, and it's good enough. Just, uh, so, yeah, it's basically it's, it's about fostering in your thinking patterns a less fine grained approach to the data and persistence. In, that, in this particular, yeah, on that slide, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. uh, yeah, on this uh, <laughs> slide. Right. Yeah. Um, I'm not. I haven't heard of Helm, but I don't know anything really about it. Could you maybe just um, talk at maybe the high <coughs> level what Helm is and sort of what it does for you? Sure. Um, Helm uses Go template. So do you know how you deploy? So the way you deploy a Kubernetes application, a pod, is you write out this YAML file. Mm -hmm. And Helm uses Go templates. It's a templating library built into the Go language to mock those out. So you can create, you can rough out your, your YAML file for your deployment as a template and you stick in the little variables, you've got looping op operations and you've got you know different mutations that you can apply to the strings that are and you feed it a dictionary of values. I don't know, it's not my code, I can't really sure. <laughs> um, and so what Helm gives you the ability to do is I can then describe the container, the actual Docker instances that I want to use, and I can describe the configuration for my deployment. You know, how big the replication set is. And then within that dictionary, I can, I can have fields for, you know, I can say replicas, replicas, colon, and then underneath of that, instead of just four, I can have dev, staging, production, developer, and four, two, eight, 36, <coughs> depending on you know, what, what environment I'm deploying to. And then when I say helm install, I say dash env equals whatever. And Helm uses my Kubernetes, Kubernetes credentials to push that out. It reads it reads some information from the kube config. It reads some information when it starts talking to its counterpart Tiller in the Kubernetes cluster, and actually fills out the rest of those templates and then applies those specs to the cluster to create whatever it is you're trying to create. It's a great tool. Um, so it's like a meta layer, meta layer on top of Kubernetes. It's a it's an installer package, really. It's it's a, it's just a way to describe how to install something. 
and you can bundle it together neatly into a tarball. And it has a you know, reasonable install semantics, install, remove, scale. Anybody else? Cool. Well, thank you all very much for coming out. Um, I hope it was useful. If it wasn't, like I said, there's some great Easter eggs in there. You can hear more intelligent people talk about these topics.